Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Um, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, I could talk at, for at length of how the government loves to hate us and what we should be saying, what should not be saying. But my son is sitting in the audience and he's given me some very strict instructions to, to stick to the script. So I'll, I'll stay there. Governor Saab has been very, uh, he spoke in detail and touched on a lot of subjects. <clears throat> I'm not going to go that route. I'm going to take a different one. You've got a lot of young people here. I'd like to discuss more on the lines of the ethos of our being. Uh, I want to talk about some things in a more abstract terms, which are abstract at one level, but very specific at another. First of all, what is my dream? My dream about Pakistan is very simple, very, very plain. I dream of a Pakistan where we can dare to dream. Let me explain, really. Who am I? My name is Muhammad Malik. I've been a journalist for 25 years and a cynic for my entire life. Uh, I've met hundreds of politicians. I mean, I wish now I hadn't met most of them. But uh, I've met bureaucrats that reminded me more of like barracudas. I've broken bread with people who have actually broken people's backs and bones to earn a living. It was my job to meet the best and the worst. I've had the privilege and the curse of seeing life up close and personal. You must remember that movie also, up close and personal. So I've been blessed with that curse. I've spent most, the larger part of my life in being in places where I don't belong and rarely in the place where I actually belong, that's my home. And, and my family can testify to that. So what have I walked away with? It's like 13 um, card, pointer cards, 16 actually. But there's a lot more to it, there's a lot more to it. Where do I start? Hmm. It, it was an ugly life. When you see the ugliness of life real close at times you become too bitter, you, you lose your passion, and you, you, you start questioning everything. But somehow, for some strange reason, I never stopped dreaming. And I'd like to share that dream with you. But being a, being a journalist, you know, it becomes a habit. You have to ask a question every time before you move on to something. So while I move on to the, my, my, my dream, I want to leave you with one question first. When was the last time you dared to dream? And also, did you ever? It's very important because we live in a society where conformity is the order of the day, where we're discouraged from questioning, from dreaming, from asking, where rights comes, come as privileges. So that is why in a society like ours, it's very important for us to understand the importance of dreaming, of dreaming wildly, of dreaming boldly. But it wasn't like this always. I mean, if, even if we take the period of General Ziaullah and others where they robbed the nation of, 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 the, of, the, of the ability to think and offer an honest opinion, whether they were mandated autocracies or, or other things, Pakistan wasn't always like that. It was a nation of dreamers. It was built by, by, by leaders who dreamt, who dreamt of a country and had the audacity and the, and the courage to find that country. It wasn't, it wasn't populated by ordinary people. Millions of immigrants. I mean, they were the immigrants who, who literally tumbled into Pakistan. And, and when the land that they stood on, the reality that they stood on, it tilted. The world changed and they carved out a new world out of it. So our genesis is not an insignificant one. We, we, we have a very noble beginning. We have a very strong and a brave beginning. So what happened? Where did we go wrong? But before we come to that, you know, I, I, I like to sort of uh, think that nations are built on dreams. And um, I was, when I was trying to put some thoughts together, and I even put some, took some things out just to sort of sound more impressive and intimidating by taking names like, you know, what Christopher Columbus would have thought and everything. So I put a few lines together, and that I'm going to write from, read from here because I don't want to lose the impact. I spent 15 minutes on that. So, so you, you guys must stay with me on this. And it says, 
You know, I, I wanted to believe, I wanted to stand next to uh, Christopher Columbus when he discovered America. And I, it says, like, you know, when he, when he stumbled upon, when he stumbled upon the green breast of the new world, beholding what must have seemed like the greatest of all human dreams. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a bad throat. For a transitory moment, he must have held his breath in the presence of this strange continent, face to face with something, commensurate to his capacity for wonder. That was the beginning, perhaps, of the American dream. Of course, you're not going to talk about all the bloodshed and everything that happened later. That, that is also bloody uh, history. But then all, all, all histories are. But even if you move on from there, nations have to begin as a dream. They, they have to begin as dreams. And they must begin with dreams. Dreams are very important, especially when you dream with your open eyes. Because the dreams are basically ideas. We can talk about at length about policies. Policies are something. Policies are pragmatic. Policies take pros and cons and everything. But dreams are pure passion. Countries, nations, they're not run by bureaucrats. They're run by passion. You can create a country. You can't create a nation. You can put a mass of people together. You can't make them into a people. There will be a question of A identity, B identity. So what binds you together? What binds us together are dreams. Our ability to dream together. Our ability to laugh together. Our ability to cry together. And unless we weave ourselves into that one common dream, things don't work. Things don't gel. And the best thing about dreams is you don't have to dream big. You can dream small. Some dreams might appear insignificant to me or to others, but the essential thing is dream you must. I don't want to sound too like some Martin Luther King thing, I had a dream or you had a dream, but it's very important because the way we have been brought up, the way we have been subjected to various, various uh, kinds of curricula, kinds of governance, rules and misrules, we, we, have come, we have come out as a confused nation. In our country, arts and culture is treated as, as some luxury, as a waste of time. If somebody is good in science, everybody says, that's a bright kid. If somebody is going to art, they say, oh, what's wrong with this guy? What's he doing? He's throwing his life away. So we, 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 are, are, we live in a quite a few of inverted pyramids. That's why, for me, the concept of dream is slightly different than just a guy going to sleep for eight hours and waking up and said, oh, I dreamt about the neighbors, so and so. So yeah, I'm not talking about those kind of dreams. I'm talking about more nobler kinds. Uh, like for example, let, let's talk about India. We love to we, we love to hate India. We love to bash India, and barring cricket, I can't I can't accept losing to Indian cricket. But short of that, I can live with India. In 50s, they created the first Indian Institute of Technology. So they started a center, and what is the, the simple thing was let's create a center of excellence. And let's start creating minds that, that would power the future engine of economic growth of India. Five decades later, it's, it's a sterling success. Today, Indians have a better career choice by staying within India than in the Western capital. In fact, the Goras and the Westerners are going to India. So what happened? In 15 years, a country that was synonymous, synonymous with the poverty, and ignorance today is, is, is a country that's been rated as somebody that's going to walk away with all the best jobs. What was the difference? The difference was one idea, one dream. Dream to be there. So it wasn't like dreams are bad, and I, I disagree with my, my earlier learned speaker, or, uh, one of the, the gentlemen moderating this thing, that some dreams are bad. No dreams are bad. I've yet to see a bad dream. And even nightmares can be fixed. Our governments are nightmares. We fix them every five years. So it's not that the nightmares can't be fixed. We live with nightmares. We elect them every, every now and then. So we, we have to admit, we have to admit that India today stands at the precipice of, you know, of, of seeing some simple idea realized into a big dream. Why can't we do that? What's stopping us? What, the only thing that's stopping us is our own lack of imagination, our own abilities, and our own warped priorities or, or 
how would you say, when you look at the, if you take a cursory uh, glance at our realities, yes, it appears that the, that the dice was loaded against us. You know, it's, everything goes wrong. And just to, because I don't forget, you know, like, we have business leaders who don't know how to lead, but they themselves are led by, by, by the force of circumstances. We, we only have leaders of the moment. We don't have statesmen. And at this point, I'd like to share a, a conversation I once had with late Noazad uh, Anusullah uh, Saab. It was myself, uh, Nusra Javid, and some others. And it was those days when uh, Nawaz Sharif Saab had just uh, created his, carried out a successful coup against uh, Junejo Saab. So we were joking with Nawaz Saab and we said, you know, like, well, you know, the new blood has come in and Junejo Saab has gone and look, Nawaz has done this, blah, 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 and all that. So Nawaz Saab had a habit of, um, if he got irritated, he would start his answer with a Farsi share, a Farsi verse. And if he knew that somebody was ignorant like me who didn't know Farsi, he wouldn't translate it. Just to rub it in, eh? you ignorant little fool, he wouldn't translate it. So that's how we would judge if his mood is good or bad. So he started off with the Farsi verse, and we had no idea, but we just went like, we knocked our head, just, you know. And then he gave a very interesting example. And he was talking in Punjabi, but I'll do a little translation for you. And he said, if an elder of a family dies, and there's no elder there, then they take the turban or the pug, and they put it on the elder's kid, who might be 10 or 12 years old. And he said, the family gets a leader. But a head of a family. But the family doesn't get an elder. What he was saying is that there will always be leaders of the moment. Power, the vacuum is not there. You will have a prime minister, you will have a president, you will have blah, 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 all the people. But you, we are suffering leaders of the moment. And leaders of the moment can't dream. They can't lead or, or encourage their, their nations into lead, their dreaming because they can't themselves. They can't inspire. They, they don't respond to situations or, or uh, needs. They react to situations. So when you have leaderships that only react and can't respond, they, they are incapable of leading or they're incapable of putting a larger vision to the people. That's why that's one of our biggest curses. So when I dream of a Pakistan, I dream of a Pakistan where at least I have a leadership. I mean, we have a leadership that sleep, sleeps all the time, I know that. But I like to have one that sort of dreams also or capable of dreaming. So that for me is one of my biggest dreams uh, for Pakistan. Then, we, we, over here the individuals, they loom larger than, than institutions. We have uh, corruption, shames integrity, intellectual and religious fanaticism. It has transformed parallel and alternate narratives into such evil evil enemies that must be vanquished. Whereas parallel narratives and alternate and wider discussions, they can be celebrated as excellent additional sources for breeding new ideas, siring new ideologies. But for us, being different is bad. And that is only because we end our logics. We, we are not willing to open up our minds. So we are discouraging parallel and alternative narratives. And that is why we see our societies closing down, our hearts just clamping up. That needs to change. If we want to change Pakistan, that needs to change in my, in, 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 uh, my thing. And when that happens, I would say that the deafening silence of thought rings the loudest in this wasteland. We need to change that. We, we need we need to, and it will only change if you dare to dream. And if you dare to dream differently, that these are the changes we want. Life is a lot more than power coming to your house 10 hours a day. I can, you can go to countries, you go to, I don't know, how, if, you, if you go to uh, Barbados, for example, if you go to Jamaica, I've been to Jamaica, it's, it's a dirt poor place. I've never seen a happy lot of people. And it's amazing. They, they don't have money. They have very few things, but they're genuinely happy. Because they're free in their minds. They're, they're free in their minds. Their, their hearts are opening up. We have started measuring everything in, in very empirical terms. I'm rich because I have a big car. 
I'm not rich because I've read 250 books. There's somebody in this audience who's actually read 250 books in three months. And I'm so thoroughly impressed. I'm poor because I may make less than X amount of money. We, we are, our concept of poor, rich, respectable, insulted, they're totally squirt. We, we, our society has become where you're respected not on the basis of your integrity and your goodness, but you're on the ability of how much damage or insult you can cause them. Me being a member of the media, I'm respected not because I'm a good man, an honest man, or a writing, I like to believe all that, and taking bold stances, because of my ability to, to damage somebody's reputation. I'm feared more than I'm respected. Is this what we want? Do we want our intellectuals or our writers or whatever to be sources of fear or sources of inspiration? Do we want to be led by people who, 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 who don't know, who can't see beyond the, beyond the wall? So we need, we need to go into, do, into a mode where we start questioning our basic approach to life. We need to look beyond simple things like how many hours of power and what, how much money this minister has done. They're, they're all real things, but we need to have a more broader uh, approach. And that's the kind of Pakistan, frankly, I'm looking for. A Pakistan that, that dares to just go beyond. A, a Pakistan where large gatherings of people are not sad gatherings. When do we gather? We gather either on a funeral, we gather when a bomb goes off, we gather for agitation, the melas are gone, the celebrations are gone, and even when we gather and there are people there, we start fearing other people. We are with our families who look like this to the other side. God, is this guy going to make a remark? Am I going to get attention? Is that blah, blah, blah. We fear each other. Civilized societies find comfort in numbers. We've, we have started finding numbers in soli comfort in solitude. That's wrong. We need to think as a people. We need to have a country where we, where we view ourselves as one small part of a larger us. It is not happening because we've divided our lives, we've divided our approach in very small, I would say, subjects. We've become specialists in life. You know, like they have in medicine, he's a heart specialist, he's a, he's a box, bone specialist, he's a dentist, blah, blah, blah. I want us to be rather a general practitioner. Take a generalized view of life as well. And that, for that, we need to have some, some common dreams. We need to create some common things that we share. There's a difference between life and vocation. And we need to draw that distinction. Uh, and from distinction, uh, just reminded me of Prime Minister Gilani. I'm thoroughly impressed by the man. Why are you guys laughing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> we have a strange ruling elite. They're, you know, their uh, priorities are not in consonance with COP people's preferences. We have a prime minister who takes pride in going down for not obeying the law. He actually says, I respect the court, but I won't obey you. You know, he, he, he heads a government that's about to be bankrupt. The economically, he might go to the slammer within a few days. The economy is in the pits, and he's dressed to the tea for dinner every day. He changes four suits, probably $1,200 suits each, and then he talks about, and then he takes, he wears a $1,200 jacket and waves this flag, waving off the train at the railway station, the business train and all that. What, what, what duplicity. What a joke. And this in a country where three years, 300 million people have gone under the poverty line. That's almost 30% of the people. In a country where a child is raped every seven hours, and that's tip of the iceberg. In a country where a mother-to-be dies every 20 minutes when she doesn't have to die. This is happening in that country. And we are all looking the other way. Should we? Or should that change? I need, I, I, I for me, I for Pakistan that refuses to close its eyes. That sees things with open eyes and looks and dreams with their open eyes. And questions. And dares to question. And oh, I could have gone on with, with uh, Gilani, but you know. Oh, and what do we have on the other side? Here's Mr. Gilani and the power elite and all the people that they present. Totally divorced, in a total disconnect with, with the people, with the, with the common man's realities. 
And what do we have? On the other side, we have the people, the common man, the youth. You know, there is a, a, dizzy, a dizzying cynicism here. They're, they're, they're totally, we're living in two separate worlds. So, we are doing shamelessly well on corruption index. The governments pay people of faith in government and governance is absolutely non-existent, it's absolutely low. Um, we are a, we are a God-fearing country, Islamic Republic of Pakistan, but when you look around, you think God has turned his face away from this, this country. Probably he's even had enough of us. So who do we turn to? We can't turn to Washington, things are not doing that good. So, and if it's a land of opportunities, apparently it's a land of opportunities for the corrupt, for, for the influential, for anybody who shouldn't be in somebody in an, any civilized uh, society. So who is it a land of opportunities for? For dishonest civil servants, for corrupt politicians, for dubious generals? Who is it this land of opportunity for? Because we the people aren't seem to be getting much share of that. The, the gravy train is missing everyone of us. At least it has missed me. So, so I can tell you things aren't right. So where do we go? Was this Jinnah's Pakistan? I don't think so. I don't think so. Was it ours? Not the way it is. So what do we do about it? The time has come now. We are at a serious crossroads. The time is not whether we can afford to have a dream or whether we should dream. I think the time has come where Pakistan needs to have a dream. We need to dream. And we need to be very clear what we are dreaming for. This is how Oscar Wilde says at one point says, when gods want to punish you, they answer your prayers. So be very careful what you dream for. Be ca very careful what you wish for. Huh. What should this dream look like? At one level it's very simple. We want everything to be good. How do we, how do we break it down really? How do we break it down? We, need to, we have to have the ability to create meaningful symbols, you know. We need to have inculcate values and ideals that are ours. What we have right now is not something we want to own up to. We need to reinvent, redefine ourselves. Nepotism must give way to merit. Opportunist to opportunity. Corruption to accountability. Lawlessness to rule of law. Very simple. Hard exploitation must see to hard work. These are obvious statements of fact. These are obvious desires. But that is the only way to go about it. And that is what we have to strive for. It's not an impossible charter. We need to dream of a Pakistan that is, you know, that is not led by those whose real lives are one flight away. This dream has to be made in Pakistan and must be lived here. Not in, 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 in London, not in south of France, not in Dubai. It's very important. It has to be a made in Pakistan that must be lived out in Pakistan. And the, one, the first step in my dream is not to make those people a part of our dream whose, whose lives are 1PK1176 thing away or EK931. You want, to, you want to share this dream, you want to make this dream, live it out and live it here. That for me is a very basic condition of this dream. You know, when I was born, Pakistan was like, what, 15 years old? Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a young looking old man. And there was, it was a promise that was to be, had to be fulfilled, a miracle in the making. I turned 50 last November. At that time, when, when Pakistan was 15, it was still confused. I turned 50, I, I'm clear my country is still confused. So what do we do? We clear things. We clear things. And we clear it in our, in our lifetime. Because it can't, it can't go on like that. And they, I don't think there was ever a better way. 
you have a truly independent judiciary. You will hear this talk about judicial overreach and others, but this judicial overreach is actually due to an executive underreach. Judiciary has to do things because the executive refuses to do, play its role. So you have, a, you have a moment where you have a very active judiciary. You have an increasingly vociferous uh, civil society. And you have an extremely, at times, obnoxiously aggressive media. My secret, I have a secret dream also, by the way. And that is that some of the TV anchors would stay quiet for a long period of time. That, that's my secret desire. And no, Javed Chaudhary is not one of them. He's giving me a dirty look. Um, so, but, but you see, it's, it's a perfect moment. So let's start dreaming now, this very moment. The best uh, thing, to, there's never a convenient time to change status quo. There's never a convenient time. It's now. Now is the best time. The best time to stop telling, start telling the truth is now, stop lying is now. Similarly, this is the best time. So what I say is, let's start dreaming now. Down to my last 10 seconds. I have to read this. Because I promised this to my three sons. I have to read this. So you have to wait for 10 seconds. It's not some great sense of oppressive tyranny that will strike and sink Pakistan. And I want you to share this thought. Please think over it. So very, it's, it's a wonderful thought given to me by a friend I value greatly. It's not some great wave of oppressive tyranny that will st strike and sink Pakistan. It will sink under the weight of its dreamlessness. Think about it. It's important. And that's why I dream of a Pakistan where there is a dream worthy of the name, the Pakistani dream. I dream of a Pakistan where Zaid, Faisal, and Mustafa, my three sons could just say, I am the Pakistani dream. Where you could come from anywhere, born rich or poor, and yet be anything you want. Where you're not held whole hostage forever to the circumstances of your birth. Or not by the circumstances of your, of, your, of your birth. But anything could happen if you worked hard enough at it. Where the one thing is, I can, I will. That's the Pakistan I dream of. Thank you and God bless Pakistan.